Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, don't be misled by my name tag where it describes me as Tom Woods, MD. That's a typo. But I've enjoyed basking in the, the uh, prestige that comes with being a, a medical doctor because of this, this name tag. It reminds me, years ago when my, my, my uh, family had the misfortune of living in an apartment in New York, one of our neighbors got some of our mail by mistake and so walked down and gave it to us and looked at the, the two on the envelope and said, I, I didn't know you were a doctor. And again, I had that same feeling, that brief moment, the prestige of being an MD. Do I tell him the truth? Do I let him down that I'm just a PhD? And so I figured I had to because, you know, what if his wife got sick and he doesn't call 911? He figures, hey, I got a doctor living next door. And all I can do is, you know, tell him about the War of 1812 or something. That's no good. So today I greet you on Constitution Day, September 17th. Now, talking about, learning about the Constitution, these are all good things. But let me define for you Constitution Day. Constitution Day, noun. Observed September 17th, the day on which American schools are unconstitutionally required to learn about the Constitution. Because, of course, there is no constitutional authorization for any federal involvement whatsoever in education, whether for good or ill. Now, I, I raise that because I sometimes think they do things like this just to drive us crazy, right? Because, for example, I think we all remember, particularly people in this room, the incident in which Nancy Pelosi, and I'm sorry I have to mention a name like this. Here you are trying to have a nice conference, and you know, it, was, it was bound to happen, right? I mean, somebody was bound to mention her name. But when Nancy Pelosi was asked about where she got the constitutional authority to pass this medical care thing, and we all remember her response. It was, are you serious? Are you serious? And then moving on to the next question. And then her spokesman said later that, you know, the speaker, of course, couldn't respond to such a ridiculous question as that. It's an absurd question. Well, I think a lot of people in the country don't find that to be such an absurd question. But it's extremely revealing that Pelosi thinks she can get away with not even, you know, it'd be one thing if she gave us a dumb answer or a lame or ridiculous or contemptible answer, but no answer at all. That's that's astonishing. That tells us something about the condition of things these days. That they, they don't even feel like we peons are entitled to an answer. They can just ridicule us and move on to the next thing. What I'm going to be talking to you about today is primarily historical, although with, I hope, current day application. But I am going to be speaking mostly about history because in spite of uh, advertising to the contrary, I don't really know that much about medicine, so I'm going to stick to what I do know. And I'm doing this because I want to provide some evidence that the solution I'm proposing is indeed well-founded, that it does indeed have a solid constitutional and historical grounding, that it's not some kind of uh, wicked or perverse approach, but rather that it is deeply embedded within the American tradition, even though practically all reference to what it is I will be talking about today has vanished down the Orwellian memory hole. Now, one thing I do have, uh, there are a lot of uh, there, there are a lot of uh, disabilities I have, but one thing I have is I have a very long retractable arm that I can use to reach down into the Orwellian memory hole where so much American history has tumbled and dig stuff out again and talk about things that we're not supposed to talk about or know about. And that's precisely this topic today, the idea of nullification. Now, this is a word that I, I think quite wrongly has a bad reputation to the extent it has a reputation at all. I think most Americans would never have heard this term, or if they had, they might confuse it with jury nullification, which is another cause I support, but that's a talk for another day. Nullification is Thomas Jefferson's answer to what do you do when you have a federal government that acts like this, that acts as if there is no Constitution, in which you're told that the Constitution really I think we're all about ready to commit an atrocity if we hear this argument any more any, uh, more times, that the Constitution is a living, breathing document that changes with the times. Get with the times, man. You know, it's 2010. It means something different now. That's what we get told. Well, let's remember 
that the American revolutionaries fought the American Revolution against a living, breathing constitution. That is exactly what the British had. That was exactly what Americans were fighting against. Because a so-called living, breathing constitution is actually a dead constitution. Because if it can change with the times, how can it protect your liberties? The government will simply tell you the next morning that, well, it has changed. You're no longer entitled to that freedom because this is a living, breathing constitution. Well, Americans pretty much said, I think we've had just about enough of this thing. And that's why it was a deliberate decision to draft a written constitution. This was not the norm in the world. To draft a written constitution to limit the US government so that we could, in fact, point to something in writing and say, now, wait a minute, you are violating this or that article in a way that you couldn't under the British system. But this idea that we have a living, breathing constitution, of course, we get things like this. I was told the other day that if you believe in a strict reading of the Constitution, why, then we would never have abolished slavery and so on and so forth. I mean, this is absurd. Right? This is sort of the New York Times version of, of the U.S. Constitution. People who oppose the so-called living, breathing Constitution are not against constitutional amendments because constitutional amendments are indeed provided for in the Constitution. It is okay to amend the Constitution. That's not the objection that we have. The objection that we have is that people who talk about a living, breathing Constitution are not talking about amending it. They're instead talking about, well, you know, we'd like to do X, Y, or Z, but the Constitution doesn't really authorize it, but it sure would be a pain in the neck to amend the Constitution, so let's just go ahead and do it anyway. That's what we're objecting to. Because Jefferson said, you may as well have a blank piece of paper for a Constitution, if that's going to be your approach. So this living, breathing Constitution nonsense makes about as much sense as saying in the middle of a poker game that your, your two-payer beats your opponent's royal flush because I forgot to tell you, this is a living, breathing poker game. It changes with the times. You're living in the past, man, now pay up. No one would accept this. So Jefferson has a response to this. What do you do with a federal government that acts like this? Well, it's interesting to know what Jefferson would argue, first of all, that you do not do. Jefferson and those who followed him were not so sure that the response to an unconstitutional law, the proper response, was to vote the bums out. Now, that might be a good idea. We wouldn't rule that out. But it takes a long time before you get your next chance to vote the bums out. And by and large, as we've seen through American history, the new bums tend not to be a whole lot better than the old bums. And there's no guarantee that your fellow Americans are going to be able to distinguish the marginally better bum from the worse. So again, this is not necessarily the solution. I mean, meanwhile, this unconstitutional law will be festering throughout American society. He was also unconvinced that federal courts were the solution. That's not to say that federal courts can have no role or could never, ever conceivably do the right thing. But by and large, he was concerned that federal courts will tend to rubber stamp what the rest of the federal government is doing. And the problem is the federal government. And the federal courts are part of the federal government. So this is not necessarily going to solve our problem. It's not impossible that it could solve our problem. But we need some sort of supplemental approach as well. Because ultimately what this boils down to is the fact that the federal government will not limit itself. You cannot establish an institution like this, hand it a piece of paper, and say, go limit yourself. It has absolutely no incentive whatsoever to limit itself, to stay limited. It has every incentive in the world to expand. So how do we keep this federal government limited? Not by expecting it to limit itself, but by having something outside the federal government do the limiting. And that for Jefferson was just common sense. Something else. Power is going to, be, is going to have to be checked by power. Ambition is going to have to be pitted against ambition. Anything else is utopian and an unreasonable expectation. So who's going to do this limiting, therefore? Well, in Jefferson's view, the logical candidate to do the limiting would be the states. Now, why is that? It's because the states in American history preceded the federal government. We had states before we had a federal government. We had states that sent delegates to a constitutional convention. Those delegates drew up the US Constitution. And then what did they do after they drew up the Constitution? Did they have a nationwide vote on whether or not we should ratify the Constitution? No. 
they went state by state because the fundamental constituent building blocks of the United States are the states. We have a collection of individual self-governing political societies. And so each of them had to make this very important decision for itself and could not bind any other state. That's the fundamental nature of the United States, is precisely that we are the United States, not the United State. That it was customary throughout much of the 19th century to say the United States are a nice place to live. Emphasis on the plurality of political societies. This was a deliberate creation. This was not an accident. The world was lousy with centralized states in which a centralized regime made the decisions for everybody in society. The world already had a whole bunch of those. It didn't need another one. We already had that model. The idea of the United States is that we're a little bit different. We're going to be the exception. We are not simply going to be a regime in which there is one irresistible power center, but rather that power is going to be broken up into little bits because we can't trust people with centralized power. And indeed, Jefferson, late in his life, even thought the states were too big to entrust with power and devised a scheme for what he called ward republics in which most decisions would be made at the level of the ward, which is just a part of a city. That was how much of a political decentralist Jefferson was. So all this thinking is very, very much contrary to the wave of nationalism that begins to overtake the Western world as the 19th century progresses, in which large centralized states become self-justifying goals. They're just ends in themselves. Well, this was certainly not the original American idea. So given that the states created the federal government, they are the principles to the constitutional compact. The federal government is merely the agent. The agent does not tell the principles what to do. The employee does not tell the employer what to do. The Frankenstein monster does not instruct Dr. Frankenstein. Well, he might, because he's big. But you get my drift. This is not how it's supposed to work. So ultimately, when there is a dispute over power, between the federal government and the states, we can't say the federal government will have a monopoly on deciding the outcome. If we say the federal government has a monopoly on determining what the extent of its own powers are, we have absolutely no right to be surprised when it keeps discovering new powers, which indeed it does. On a weekly basis, we learn all these new powers we never knew were there. Turns out they are there. Why? Because only they get to interpret the terms of the compact. Jefferson says no. I mean, only a fool would enter into a an agreement like this in which only one side gets to interpret the terms. No, the states, he said, as the principles, the states need in the last resort to be able to render constitutional decisions, to in effect say that the federal government has gone beyond its constitutional powers and therefore the idea of nullification simply boils down to the power of a state to say to the federal government, you know and I know that what you've just done is unconstitutional. And you may treat the Constitution with contempt, but this state does not. In this state, we have too much respect for the Constitution to allow you to get away with enforcing an unconstitutional law. Because in our view, an unconstitutional law is not a law. It is null and void from the moment of its alleged passage. That's what nullification boils down to. Now, where does this come from? Where do we first see this uh, given voice? Well, we first really hear it in the seminal year 1798, because it's in that year that Jefferson drafts something called the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798 that have fallen down that memory hole, and James Madison drafts the Virginia Resolutions of 1798. In the Virginia Resolutions, Madison says that if the federal government exceeds its constitutional powers, that the states are duty-bound to resist. Duty-bound to resist. So notice he does not say that if the federal government exceeds its constitutional powers, the states could flip a coin, and if it comes up heads, they could resist. They're duty-bound to resist, says Madison. Jefferson introduces the concept of nullification in his draft of the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798, and the word itself appears in follow-up resolutions the following year. And these became known as the Principles of 98, and those principles can be stated very simply. The federal government is a limited government. It is a government of enumerated powers. It has only the powers expressly spelled out in the Constitution and none other. And so if the federal government, therefore, attempts 
to impose upon the people some additional condition, to exercise some supplementary power, then the states must say no. Those are, those are referred to as the principles of 98, and they enjoyed a long and distinguished lineage in U.S. history until they fell down the memory hole. They were not, in fact, used to defend slavery, which, is, which I'll get to later, uh, which is what any time you hear the states mentioned, immediately you're accused of having all kinds of sinister intentions and you want to bring back slavery and so on and so forth. We're going to leave that childishness for, for a little bit later because, that, because it is. I mean, you, this can be dismissed almost immediately. Anybody who raises this, this with you, you can just start, in your head anyway, smiling because you're going to win this argument. The person has no idea what he's talking about. Now, in a follow-up report in the year 1800, that's sometimes referred to as Madison's Report or, or the Report of 1800 or the, or the Virginia Report, in this report, Madison revisited his resolutions of 98 and confirmed what he had concluded there and reminded his fellow Americans that we need some recourse for those situations in which even the judicial branch betrays us. So it is not enough simply to rely on the courts we need something else in addition to that. Okay, so where does this all come from? I mean, did Jefferson, and first of all, why did they do this? Why 1798? Well, as some of you know, 1798, we got the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798, uh, one provision of which made it a crime punishable by fine and or imprisonment to criticize the president or Congress. And indeed, newspaper editors were imprisoned under this act uh, one U.S. congressman from Vermont, a congressman who indeed fought in the American Revolution, was imprisoned. Uh, his constituents, by the way, took up a collection to pay his $1,000 fine and indeed re-elected him to Congress while he was incarcerated. How, how heroic is this, right? It's astonishing. Now, uh, Jefferson's view was, you know, look, my copy of the Constitution says you can't do this, right? I mean, I'm pretty sure you can't actually put people in jail for, especially when you look at how utterly mild their criticisms of, of John Adams' work. You know, he's a pompous jerk. You know, wow, well, gee, I guess we better put that guy in jail. It's unbelievable what people were getting away with. And also, Jefferson realized the partisan nature of this. I mean, remember in the old days, originally the way it worked was if you got the, the high, if you were the highest vote getter, the top vote getter becomes the president. The second highest becomes the vice president. So you could easily have people from two different parties serving in the same administration which is precisely what you had under John Adams. You had John Adams, the Federalist, and Thomas Jefferson, the Republican. And notice how the Sedition Act is worded. You can't criticize the President, and you can't criticize the Congress. Oh. <laughs> well, Jefferson wasn't born yesterday, so he could see what was going on here. And in fact, as he was corresponding with James Madison about what should we do about this, I mean, we, we can't just let this pass, you think to yourself as a historian, I'd like to read the correspondence between Jefferson and Madison regarding this issue. And yet you can't read that correspondence. You know why? Because it does not exist. Because Jefferson was convinced just by examining the mail he was receiving that his mail was being tampered with. Here he is, the Vice President of the United States. And he said, I don't know which is worse, that I feel afraid to express my thoughts in my country, or that my country would bear such a state of things. So that's what prompted this. But where did the idea, where did the approach of nullification come from? I mean, was it a matter of Jefferson got really upset about all this, so he got drunk one night and he drafted the Kentucky resolutions, and then the next morning he wakes up all hungover and looks at them and says, oh my gosh, I hope I, hope I haven't submitted these crazy drunken things. I mean, was it that? No, to the contrary. Jefferson did not just invent these out of whole cloth out of his head. He's getting this from the ratifying convention of Virginia. When Virginia was ratifying the Constitution, deciding whether or not to ratify, they held a convention in Richmond in 1788. And we had skeptics of the Constitution there, including Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry looked at the Constitution and said, I, I see some clauses in here that I'm afraid one might be able to gallop a horse through, so what are we going to do about this? This seems like this will be an unlimited government. What did supporters of the Constitution say to Patrick Henry to reassure him? Well, they said, don't worry, this federal government is limited. It's going to have only the powers expressly delegated to it. In fact, 
there was a five-man commission that was given the task of drafting the instrument of ratification, that is the document by which Virginia would officially enter the Union. And that five-man commission consisted of well, the two people I'm going to talk about are Edmund Randolph, who became the first Attorney General, and George Nicholas, who became the first Attorney General of Kentucky. And Randolph said, don't worry, this is a limited government. So Randolph's opinion matters a lot. I mean, he's the guy who's drafting the document by which Virginia will interpret its own ratification, what the meaning of it was. And George Nicholas said, oh, and by the way, if the federal government tries to impose upon us, and these are his words, any supplementary condition, that is to say, if it tries to exercise a power not listed in Article I, Section 8 of the document, don't worry, Virginia will be exonerated because we never agreed to that. We're only agreeing to the powers in Article I, Section 8. So don't worry, if anything else is imposed on us, we just point to it and say, sorry, that doesn't, doesn't hold water in Virginia. Well, sounds kind of like the idea of nullification right there in the ratifying convention. And even with that assurance, Virginia only barely voted to ratify the Constitution. And as the 1790s go along, between 1788 up to 1798, you see Patrick Henry in the Virginia legislature uh, reminding his fellow Virginians of these assurances that they were given at the ratifying convention. John Taylor, who's Jefferson's friend, a very important political pamphleteer and, and uh, uh, one-time U.S. Senator. John Taylor was also following up on this, arguing that the states had to play the role that we today associate with the Supreme Court. So this is all totally mainstream when Jefferson picks, this, picks up this wave of thinking in 1798. This is not some crazy, whacked-out extremist view. This was the mainstream of Virginian political thinking that had first been laid out by, not by opponents, but by supporters of the Constitution at the 1788 ratifying convention. Now, how many of our kids are taught anything like this in school, right? I mean, could we round it off to zero? Nothing. Nothing. It's just, I mean, it's like, it's like you can hear crickets, so no mention of this at all. But this is all sitting there in the records, which are easily consulted. I mean, I didn't have to make any of this stuff up. Now, if we look at the real history of this, and as I hinted at uh, earlier, when you talk about the states, you're immediately going to be accused of being a sinister person, and we all know states are evil, and the federal government is wise and progressive, and so on and on. Now, if I wanted to push a pro so-called progressive agenda, and I, wanted, and I wanted to increase the powers of the federal government, I would push that narrative, too. Sure, I would push that. Just get people to think that anything that involves the states is, is wicked and backward and stupid, and everything that's wise and progressive takes place at the federal level. Of course I'd want to push that narrative. Here's the trouble with it. It's, it's simply not true. I mean, we all know that, of course, states' rights, the powers of the states, have indeed been associated with disreputable causes and even wicked causes. Nobody disputes that. But so has the U.S. Constitution itself. So has the Bible. So, I mean, that doesn't make these things in and of themselves wicked. It makes the misinterpreters of them wicked. But moreover, if we look at, on balance at this cause, on balance, it was exercised on behalf of human freedom. We already see this idea being vindicated on behalf of the right of free speech against a tyrannical federal government. We see it in the northern states. In fact, the northern states had recourse to this more than the southern ones did. We see the northern states holding up these principles to fight against what they considered to be an unconstitutional embargo. We see them fighting against unconstitutional searches and seizures with reference to the principles of 98. And their example after example that I mention in, uh, in this thing here. Incidentally, this is the, my, my book has got the word nullification stamped over a scene of Obama and his cronies with him signing the health care bill. And I had the good fortune, this is just in parentheses, but a couple months, a few months ago, I was on a uh, Glenn Beck show where Beck was talking about The Road to Serfdom, this book by F.A. Hayek. So I was on there for the whole show talking about that book. This book hadn't come out yet, so they identified me as the author of this book, and it was flashed on the screen for about three seconds. Three seconds flashed on the screen. We, we weren't even talking about this particular book. And that was enough, even before it came out, to make it an Amazon bestseller, just because people saw this cover. So, it occur, you know, so they may not know what nullification is, but if it's stamped over this scene, they want to sign up for it, it turns out. I, I, was, I was pleasantly surprised. Now, I've, unfortunately, although I have been able to do a lot of TV in, in the past, the only TV host who dares to have me on for this subject is, of course, Judge Andrew Napolitano. The other ones are, you know, too afraid of it and they want to run the other direction. Now, as this gains steam, of course, then they'll all pretend that they were 
leading the bandwagon the whole time, and that'll be okay. Let bygones be bygones. Better late than never. I'm not going to hold a grudge, but really, it's like this is radioactive, even though the tea parties are all set to do this. I mean, even if they don't get the blessing of certain television hosts, they're, it's too bad, but they're going to they're do it anyway. So you look through history, and you see particularly the most uh, perhaps uh, well-known example of nullification, other than the South Carolina tariff nullification, was the use of these principles by northern states to fight against the fugitive slave laws. Now you may say, well, wait a minute, isn't, isn't, the fugitive, isn't there a fugitive slave clause in the Constitution after all, right? I mean, is this a, a misuse of nullification? Because that, that's not an unconstitutional law. Well, to make a long story short, I give the details in the book, but to make a long story short, they believe there were unconstitutional features of these laws. That yes, there is such a clause in the Constitution. That does not mean the federal government can use any means whatsoever, any conceivable means to go after runaway slaves. And indeed, some states thought that it, was, it infringed on their powers to protect their people against kidnapping, to have a policy that says a slaveholder, a southern slaveholder, can come into your state and say, hey, I've got a physical description of the slave who ran away from me, and uh, you know that guy over there kind of looks like him, so I think I'm going to take him. Th there were some people who thought, you know, I think that system is just a teensy-weensy bit open to abuse. So we're not doing that. Uh, we're not going to let anyone be taken out of our state without giving them a jury trial first. So in fact, when you look at the South Carolina Ordinance of Secession from December 20th, 1860, what is the South Carolina complaining about? One of the things it's complaining about is the North is nullifying too much. So this is the exact opposite. I mean, anytime you talk about this to somebody who's even heard the word, they'll say, oh, this is some crazy Confederate view, Southern, Southern view. And by the way, not, not that there's anything particularly wrong with the South per se, but the point is this is not by any means a Southern view per se. And, and, and as I say, it has nothing to do with the Civil War. Why would the South have had to nullify anything? The Constitution upheld slavery at the time. What would the South have had to nullify? It was the North that was doing most of the nullifying. So this is, this is it's the exact opposite of what, of what most people in, indeed think. This is, a, this is an American cause, uh, not, not really a Southern one. Now I want to talk a little bit about the situation today. Um, and so to preface that, and I, I'm, I'm drinking a, a lot of water, uh, partly because, not that you guys need to know this, but um, I have real trouble sleeping when I know I have to get up extremely early the next morning. So yesterday morning I had to get up extremely early because I was doing some, uh, Judge Napolitano has this great show on the Fox Business Network called Freedom Watch. It's worth getting the network just to watch this show. So I, I did a clip for that, but I have to go to Kansas City for it. It's like an hour and a half drive. Like the Topeka studio refuses to open that early, and so I have to wake up at the crack of dawn and all that. And then this morning I had to be up at 4.30 in the morning to get my flight. So I pretty much probably slept about two hours combined the past two days. So uh, those, since you're all physicians, you realize that this is some kind of medical miracle that I'm coherent at all up here. Now you guys could have a whole weekend conference on how this is even happening up here without any coffee or anything. So I... I'm a little bit dehydrated from all that's been going on with me. But what I want to preface this with is, when I came out with this book, I sort of anticipated a lot of attacks because, you know, I mean, this is not even on the table, right? I mean, this is some kind of, you know, we're supposed to allow the New York Times and MSNBC to define the terms of debate for us. You know, they're going to tell us what we're allowed to debate. We can debate should the top marginal income tax rate be 39.1 or 39.0%. They're, they're perfectly okay with us debating that. Um, they're okay with us deciding which kind of managed care do we want. Okay, but, but if we say, I want to abolish, should we have any such and such at all? Should we have this department at all? Not should it get 28 billion or 29 billion, should we even have it? That's the sort of thing that we're not supposed to talk about. That's irresponsible. You're getting a little bit uppity here. You're not letting the New York Times define the terms of debate. We're allowed to debate things within like a three inch range. So nullification is like over here. Like how dare we raise this? Who do we think we are? I mean, Keith Olbermann hasn't approved this. How dare we even think it? So I, I figured I would, I would get some attacks. So what I, what I did was I launched a sort of preemptive strike of my own by means of, of YouTube. YouTube is a great, a great equalizer in this world. It's, it allows you to do things and get around the gatekeepers of established opinion in ways that people in the past could only have dreamed of. I mean, this is Gutenberg times a million. So what I did was I, I made a video, and with I have a, a friend who's extremely good with media, so very professionally done, thanks to him. I did this interview, uh, this uh, this video called "Interview with a Zombie," and the premise of the video is that this zombie has his own television talk show. He interviews authors, 
and he's interviewing me about my book, Nullification. So I realized right away, this sounds like a show on MSNBC already, right? In fact, I had, I had people write to me saying, how did you get Keith Olbermann to interview like that? That was great. So we did this, and the idea of it is that all he can do, the whole interview, and, and by the way, I got a professional voiceover guy who actually does voiceovers to do the welcome to interview with a zombie. So it, it seems like a real show, right? It's unbelievable. And the idea is that he, he's a zombie, he can say only one word at a time. We arbitrarily decided the zombie can utter one word at a time. So to start the interview, he just simply says, book. So I give, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit taken aback by this, but I go ahead and give sort of an overview of the book. And then he realizes, wait a minute, I got some kind of crazy guy on my show. This is not approved stuff. So then he starts throwing these smear terms at me, the sort of terms that are thrown at you when people are not trying to debate you, because they probably can't. They're trying to destroy you. They're trying to ruin your career. They're trying to smear you. So he just starts doing that. And no matter, every time he throws a smear word at me, like, slavery. And I say, well, actually, I mean, nullification was never used on behalf of slavery. I mean, can you point an example? And then, so he's on to the next smear. And then later, later he's back to slavery again. And I said, but I already answered this. Like, it's exactly like what would happen if you were interviewed by an actual person, but that person wouldn't have the excuse of being a zombie. So the idea was that now anytime I get attacked, uh, like in a blog or something, my friends just go and post this video, the link to it in the comments section, and they call the insulter, the, the smearer, a zombie. And so it, it, it totally defangs the other side. Because now, now they all feel silly, whatever, everybody's laughing at them. So it, it, the one thing I'd like you to do is a favor for me. I mean, you know, you don't necessarily have to buy my book, although that would be nice too. But, but in addition to or other than that, I want to ask you to do me this favor. I actually purchased the domain name interviewwithazombie.com. Yes, I did that. Could you believe that was available? It was available. I bought it. <laughs> so if you go to interviewwithazombie.com, that takes you right to the YouTube. I, I bought that domain name so I wouldn't have to be on the radio saying, okay, now go to YouTube and type in blah, 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 blah interviewwithazombie.com. It actually takes you to the page on my own site that hosts this video, and I think you'll get a, sort of a kick out of what we were able to get away with. And whatever you do, make sure if you do watch it, it's only about eight minutes, watch it up to the last frame, and you'll understand why when, when you see it at the end. Okay. Now, I understand, um, again, that today a lot of our focus is on lawsuits against the Obama health care thing, and I have no objection to these lawsuits. And there's you know, there's a possibility that they could indeed work in this case. As I said, though, they're, they're not by any means foolproof. I mean, there is no foolproof answer. But here's the concern about lawsuits. Look at the argument, the legal argument we have to make in court against this particular bill. We cannot go in there and say, even though this is perfectly correct, we still can't go in there and say, the U.S. Constitution makes no provision for the federal government to be involved in health care at all. So therefore, this is unconstitutional. That would be a non-starter. That we can't even do, because there, there won't be any court that would uphold that. That's impossible, even though it happens to be correct. So if you're wondering why the focus is on the federal government has never in the past required an individual to purchase a, a good from a private provider, that's because this is the only way this can be framed in which it has a prayer of winning. So, so this, this makes me concerned, because suppose we do win this, and suppose somehow, just somehow, they get the political will to push through a single-payer system, where you wouldn't have people being required to buy a private good, the government would be providing it for them, that might actually survive a court challenge. Because then what would you argue? That the federal government has never provided medical services before? That's not true. And maybe it was unconstitutional when they did it before, but it's been done for a while now, so too late to do anything about it. This is the, one of the real difficulties that, that we face here. Now, at the same time, it's also a difficulty for nullification. There is no real silver bullet here. And I, you know, I don't want to be a snake oil salesman who claims to be selling something that solves all problems. I readily concede it does not. The tricky part about nullifying the legislation is this. Okay, suppose the state says, we're not going to let you do this in our state. And let's suppose that the state really actually does indeed draft a resolution that addresses this forthrightly. I mean, let's say it's not like what happened in Louisiana. Louisiana passed a Health Care Freedom Act. And it's amazing how 
legislators cannibalized the original. Because when you see the final copy of this thing, I mean, you're, not, you're probably not even going to believe me this is such an outrage. The, very, the, the, the health care freedom bill in Louisiana goes through, you know, this is an outrage, the federal government can't do this, and we protest, we protest, we're not going to let them do this, 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 and this. And then you turn the page, and on page two, the last provision says, nothing in this act shall be intended to contradict any federal law in effect. Well, then what in the world is the point of it? <laughs> Like, it doesn't even make sense if it doesn't contradict. Like, what could that mean? But let's say they did, let's say they, they didn't play games like that. What happens when I, Tom Woods, say, look, I'm, not, I'm just not doing it. I'm just not doing it. I'm, I'm not buying the thing they want me to buy. And, so, and, and let's say that, therefore, the IRS just penalizes me. They dock my income tax refund. What can a state do about that? Because, because of the 16th Amendment, the federal government has a direct hand into the citizen's pockets. It goes right over the state into the citizen's pocket. Very hard for the states to cope with that. Not impossible, not impossible, but I'm afraid that what would be necessary for the states to resist in this particular case, I'm not sure public opinion is ready for. Now, it should be ready for it, and we should prepare the ground for it, but basically what we would need to start thinking about is a proposal that some state legislators have considered uh, called uh, federal tax escrow accounts. And again, yes, this is going to sound like, oh, gee, this is, this is not mainstream. I don't hear uh, Chris Matthews or Sean Hannity talking about this. Oh, okay, but I think we need to broaden the range of options that we are looking at here. I mean, this is, I don't think we're going to be able to overturn a century of federal legislation using uh, tried and true conventional methods that have failed us for a century. We're going to have to think of different approaches. Such an account would basically operate like this. It could simply be a matter of a state saying, you know that uh, gas tax that we help collect for you guys, well, we're going to hold it back and we're going to use it to reimburse anybody who is penalized unjustly for not cooperating with the health care bill. Now, could they get away with that? If, if public opinion is strongly enough behind it, I think they could. I'm just not sure it would be. California gives an interesting example. California has the medical marijuana situation in which the Supreme Court ruled against them, you're not allowed to do this. The Ninth Circuit later ruled against them, you're not allowed to do this. The Justice Department said you're not allowed to do this, and they kept on doing it anyway. And to the point where the Justice Department finally said, all right, well, we're just not going to bother enforcing this anymore. So in other words, if there is enough of a critical mass of the population that's willing to say no, then nullification as a form of civil disobedience sanctioned by a state, state government can indeed be carried out. Uh, other uh, more ambitious forms of, of, of tax escrow accounts would involve having all federal taxes first pass through the state treasury, and the states make determinations about the constitutionality of federal government activities. Now, again, this is not on the table, people, wanna, but as any, everything that is on the table isn't going to work. I mean, really, here we've got this. I was just listening. One benefit to being uh, in the car as early as I was, I got to listen to the Mike Church show. He's the only radio host I listen to. He's on XM from, uh, I guess you guys are in mountain time, so he's on from 4 to 7 a.m. So get right up and listen. But he's, he's saying, look, we got this trillion and a half dollar deficit, and, and the best we can hear from the other side is, well, if we get in, we'll try and trim it by like 100 billion. I mean, this is, I mean, come on, this is an emergency here. We've got to think of different, different approaches. So what I'm suggesting then is that in addition to nullification, which I do think uh, needs to become a commonplace in our um, political language once again. I think in addition to this, we need the, the following reform. Let's suppose we had a system like this. Given that the 17th Amendment to the Constitution, which I won't go into here, but the 17th Amendment to the Constitution, I think, uh, really uh, limited the state's abilities to really keep, rein in the federal government, we could restore some of that if we had this system. Suppose we say, that if a simple majority of the states, so a mere 26 states, and the method doesn't matter, it could be the state legislature doing it, it could be the uh, state attorney general doing it, it could be a popular referendum, the method doesn't matter. But if 26 states declare that a federal law is unconstitutional, then it's repealed. Now that would be a useful reform because that, although that's not the same thing as nullification, it clearly bears a family resemblance to the principles of 98 because notice what it's doing. It's it's having something outside the federal government do the limiting. That's the main theme here. And it's true, a lot of times we feel like we have very little control over our state legislatures, but we have infinitely more control over them than we have over the U.S. Senate. 
We have zero control over the U.S. I mean, part of the job description of being a U.S. Senator is to ignore everyone, you know, except a small elite of people. I mean, really, they pay no attention. You know, your calls are 2,000 to 1 against something. They still vote for it. It makes no difference. But your state legislatures, well, you can actually have some influence there. So if it was a matter of, yeah, sure, trying to get federal laws repealed, you, know, you get one every 25 years. But at the state level, we're, I mean, we can actually win state races, people who are sympathetic to our points of view. Nobody votes in state races. Nobody. Nobody votes in these local races. Nobody donates to their campaigns. If we took some of the resources that we're throwing into a lot of these national races and poured them into the local level, we'd, we'd have, I think, much better results. And if we had a system in which the, the state legislature, which is more responsive to us than the Congress, the U.S. Congress is, if they had collectively, 26 of them, some kind of veto over federal legislation, you would actually see things stopped in their tracks. You would actually see things reversed. This is the sort of thing that needs to be talked about. Law professor Randy Barnett at Georgetown University just proposed this the other day, although he's proposing it, and indeed I propose it in my book, as a two-thirds majority of the states. And then almost as soon as the ink was dry, I said, two-thirds, that's too much. A simple majority. Just a simple majority. I mean, the federal government has, gets the benefit of the doubt often enough. Forget this two-thirds of the state stuff. Simple majority uh, to do it. So because Professor Barnett is at least raising the principle that something outside the federal government has to do the limiting, I, I hope that we may begin to have some fruitful discussions in this direction. Now, we all know that nothing is going to change. Nothing is going to change if we continue along the same path. We just keep voting for people who give pretty speeches and then stab us in the back. And as they stab us in the back, we're supposed to clap our hands and vote for them again, and on and on. Uh, there are people slightly waking up from this. I guess those of you who are actually from Utah know about what happened to Bob Bennett this year, what the Tea Party did to him. He, he was a three-term senator. He was a three-term senator who seems to have had the opinion that, look, I'm a three-term Republican senator, so I am entitled to rule over you forever. And I'm going to because, you know, you guys are a bunch of suckers and I got an R next to my name. He was defeated by two Tea Party candidates in the primary. And he was defeated in large part because he had voted for the bailouts. And the CNN reporter is talking to the founder of the Tea Party of Utah, is appalled at this, that the that the, uh, the peasants are getting so uppity that they would vote against their betters like this. Don't they know that their role is to sit back and shut up and be exploited and be happy about it? And uh, the reporter said to this guy, well, is it really fair that a man's career should end because of one vote? <laughs> and his response was, his career will end with that vote. Very good. Okay, maybe we are indeed seeing progress. But it's going to take a lot of this, and it's going to take a lot of, I'm not just going to be satisfied with some pretty speeches. Uh, it's going to take something different. It's going to take limiting this thing by means, of, with the use of a mechanism other than the thing itself, namely the states. Now, to take this position, it's true. You're going to have to stand against the media and political establishments. Well, you know, that's no surprise. We do that every day. We do that every day. So what? So what? What could they say about us they haven't said already? You know, I mean, they, they demonize people like us all the time. That horse has left the stable. So let's go ahead, let's go all out and use every mechanism of defense that Thomas Jefferson tried to bequeath to us. Because indeed, you will have to stand against a lot of influential people to adopt a position like this. But in so doing, you will be standing with Thomas Jefferson. And that is never a lonely place to be. Thank you very much.